going to start off this panel with uh, two very brief presentations. By brief, I mean just a minute or two or three. Uh, by two of the analysts. I'm going to ask each person as they talk for the first time to introduce themselves, name and where they are in title, and, and then we'll have an open discussion about where we're going uh, with price and about suggestions that these folks think uh, are good suggestions for people who run these companies. How should, how should the runners, the, the leaders, interact with the street generally? So David, uh, please introduce yourself and kick us off. So I'm David Nierengarten. I'm Managing uh, Director in Equity Research at Wedbush Securities, uh, located in San Francisco, actually. So, uh-oh, do we have a, where's the slide? Is it? Oh, first slide? Sorry. There we go. So just, uh, I was tasked with thinking broadly about economic cycles and uh, the biotech IPO market. And broadly speaking, perhaps it's not a surprise, but uh, the biotech IPO and med device and ophthalmology IPO issuance is broadly linked uh, to the economic cycle. That should be a, you know, pretty clear when the economic cycle is expanding, when the economic cycle, uh, the growth is expanding, uh, the stock market is recovering, uh, people are willing to invest in new issuance and new IPOs. Um, recent IPO issuance also has been aided by a perception that the FDA has you know, uh, been a little bit more lenient or at least has definitely approved more drugs uh, recently, which of course allows you know, for greater investor enthusiasm and greater um, investor uh, participation in IPOs. Um, one thing that's interesting that I would throw out there as a, maybe a point of contentions, but as to build on a, a prior presentation, IPO issuance has not been really related to actual IPO performance. Uh, the median IPO performance over the past year, surprisingly, is a negative number. It's a, last time I checked, is about minus 12%. And so I think a little bit of investor psychology is that the IPO I'm investing in is special. It's a special snowflake. Um, so just to reiterate, I, I do believe IPO issuance is actually related to economic cycles and not to um, actual performance. Uh, next slide. So where are we in the cycle if IPO issuance is related to, to it? Uh, I hate to say it, but the best estimate for me is the middle. Uh, there's a series of you know, plus and minus economic indicators. Uh, I, I list up there inflation, GDP growth, et cetera. Um, but generally, the trend has been positive up and to the right, as we like to say, despite uh, pretty much an annual correction of 10 to mi minus 10 to minus 20 percent in the biotech markets. Uh, we're still seeing more IPO issuance. So then the question comes, of course, is when is it going to end and how? Um, on the next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, when is it going to end? It's going to end when there's a recession. Um, we've seen that before. As I like to say, recessions are bad for biotech IPOs and other living things. Um, it's, it's going to be bad again when we hit another recession, in my opinion. Uh, I, IPO issuance drops to near zero uh, during recessions, and that's just a fact of life. Um, when, when does a recession occur? Well, there's lots of arguments of economics you know, 101 on why recessions occur. But an indicator that I like to use is a yield curve. Um, there's a lot of theoretical reasons why, but basically, once it goes negative, when long-term rates are less than short-term rates, um, we get a recession 12 to 18 months later. And we've seen that in the last couple cycles. If I were to expand this out, uh, you would see it um, in the past 40 to 50 years um, post-World War II. So broadly speaking, um, biotechs are related to the economic cycle, biotech IPO issuance. and we will continue to look good until it stops, until the uh, economic cycle begins to contract. And just one second before you step away, mm -hmm. I'd like to keep both microphones on, please, if you would. Um, so you said more than 12 to 18 months you predict a recession. Is that true? No, no, we, because we haven't seen an inverted yield curve yet. So we're, we're still in a, in a, so in a happy more, place. It yeah, it's more it, than 12 yeah, to 18 more months. More than 12 to 18 months from now. Great. Yep. Great. Thanks for that summary, uh, David. And we'll have Phil come up, introduce himself, and then show us why maybe uh, cycles are going to change. Hi, I'm Phil Nato, a manager director and senior biotech analyst at Cowan & Company. And um, as Emmett suggested, I was tasked with uh, putting together some data that could suggest 
biotech may be less susceptible to market downturns uh, the next time around. The mantra on Wall Street is that if the market gets the sniffles, biotech catches the flu. Historically, we've been very high beta, uh, very much correlated uh, with the markets and our stock performance. We, um, we looked first at the large caps and found actually some encouraging trends that do suggest that the fundamentals suggest biotech large caps could be more defensive uh, than they have been in the past. So here we compare some of the financial metrics between biotech large caps and the top holdings of the consumer staples uh, ETF. Consumer staples are historically a very defensive sector. And we actually find um, the biotech fundamentals look actually quite good compared to the, the consumer staples. So biotech large caps are trading at almost the same PE. Uh, as those consumer staples, but they have much higher revenue and EPS growth. So uh, with those type of fundamentals, we think this, that um, these stocks will continue to be in favor uh, even should there be a broader market downturn. Another reason that biotechs are susceptible to market downturns is that this is a very capital intensive industry. It requires a lot of cash to, uh, to move programs through development. And uh, as David suggested, when, um, when there is a, a poor economic cycle, the financing window closes, which can be really tough, particularly on the small cap stocks. And, and you can see those stocks trade off as they get shorter on cash and people worry about their future. Uh, here we look at the average cash balance of the small and mid-cap biotechs in Coward's coverage universe. We do cover about 100 stocks today, so this is a decent swath of the, the public industry. Uh, and we find that cash balances today are higher than they've been any time over the last 10 years. So that should help the industry, again, um, weather the next downturn. Then last, one, one thing that we debate on Wall Street is whether um, the fundamentals of drug discovery have improved. Are the rates of F phase three success and FDA approval getting higher as we have an accommodative FDA and maybe science has advanced so that clinical uh, failure is somewhat less likely? We at Cowan looked at this. Uh, we, we analyzed two 12-month periods, one during the last bear market in 2008 and then a period uh, during this bull market. We found some suggestion that this may actually be true. We, we see about a three to four uh, percentage point improvement in both the rates of phase three success and the rate of FDA approval. It's kind of anecdotal. I'm not sure it supports that things are getting better, but it certainly says they're not getting worse. Uh, and so we do continue to expect the industry to pump out more, um, more candidates and more drugs over the next several years. Great. Thank you, Phil. So um, perhaps uh, a bit more resilience in the cycles uh, this time around, perhaps a little better at doing and predicting the science on your end, what, what's going to win and where it's going to be. Uh, well, let's pull up some of the slides, if you would, from the back uh, that uh, I've come up with that, so that we can, we're going to reverse, go back one, please. Um, so that we can talk through this as a panel. Reverse one back, please. Is that uh, okay? Uh, where are we in the market cycle? Have cycle dynamics change in, in biotech, medtech? So we've heard sort of the, the bull and the bear, the pros and the cons. I'm going to start with Josh, and um, we're going to just hear your thoughts on where we are, not, not on a temporal basis, but how you think about market cycles and how it influences how you think about the stocks you cover. So your thoughts. Sure. Uh, thank you for that. For, uh, having me on the panel, uh, Joshua Schimmer from Piper Jaffray. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about innovation you know, and innovation cycles. Um, typically, innovation is rewarded no matter what the cycle is. Uh, maybe it's not an IPO. Maybe it's, maybe it's a sale of a private company. Um, just, just being in the audience today, uh, just hearing about these companies and the innovation going on in ophthalmology has been, has been mind-blowing. Um, uh, it's, it's such an exciting time in this field in particular because I think one of the challenges historically with ophthalmology has been uh, limited visibility. You know, the, the eye has kind of been a black box for a long time and it's been hard to really get comfortable analyzing risk profiles with the technologies. But I think today was just an amazing illustration of all these different segments of ophthalmology where, where the risk profile is coming down. The innovation is so much stronger than I've seen it in a, in a very long time, even going back to, to, to early stage targets now where you can actually feel a high degree of comfort. And so for me, the most important cycle we are in is, is the very beginning of an absolute boom of breakthroughs and innovation in ophthalmology. I, I've never been quite so excited. You know, I mean, you, you know, I've done a lot of work in gene therapy because if you know what gene is broken, you kind of know how to correct it. So, so you've eliminated your target risk. But then seeing so much more today across so many different aspects of ophthalmology from glaucoma to AMD, 
uh, to, to other genetic disorders, et cetera, and, and seeing how these programs build on first principles. And you can get really comfortable that these are programs worth investing in. So, you know, to me, everything else is noise. You know, we'll go through economic upturns and downturns, and we'll, you know, we'll have concerns about drug pricing, blah, blah, blah. But, but at the end of the day, innovation is going to be rewarded. And this kind of innovation, I think, is going to be rewarded very well. Great. Carolyn? So, yes, I think um, I agree with uh, most of what I just said. Uh, I'm Caroline Corner from Cantor Fitzgerald. And uh, Cantor Fitzgerald is a bank where all of our IPO candidates are special snowflakes. Just let the private companies know. So tagline. Um, <laughs> but, yes, um, <laughs> We, uh, I, I've looked historically at a lot more med tech than biotech, but now I, I look at a, a mix. Uh, certainly, uh, med tech, you have to be a little bit further along in the, the program to be rewarded. Um, and certainly, med tech, I think, is consistent over time. Biotech bounces around a little bit more. Uh, just looking at some data of uh, last you know, five quarters uh, comparing number of deals and number of deals closed and dollar values closed for uh, pharma, biotech, and medtech. And everyone is always excited about biotech. And biotech really goes up and down a bit. But the last four or five quarters, there have been more deals closed in medtech. And in the last four or five quarters, there's been more dollar value closed in, in medtech as well. So. Sometimes uh, I think taking a step back and just looking at trends over time, it, you know, things don't necessarily change that much, and there's a lot of consistency in medtech, and there's also a fair amount of consistency that biotech's going to go up and down over time. Uh, thank you. For the AVT team, I, I have the controller now, so I, I didn't actually want you to advance that slide, but uh, we are where we are now. Did anyone, before we come back to this slide, did anyone else had co have any comments about, uh, you know, market cycles? Uh, and, and how resilient or not the biotech and medtech industries are. Anand, and then Yagel, and then we'll move to this question. Uh, sure. Thanks, Ahmed, and thanks for having me here. I'm uh, Adnan with RBC Capital Markets, uh, and I'm really torn between two things that Ahmed kind of brought up. You know, does history repeat itself, or, or is this time different? And if I have to pick, I'll pick that this time it's different. Science doesn't stand still. You know, we, we get to tell your stories, and all of your stories are different. So innovation leads that path which can break through, quote unquote, windows being closed. The audience that you talk to, it's becoming increasingly more sophisticated. The investors that you go to are scientists, half the time like yourselves, they're MD, PhDs. They will not paint every company with the same brush. So if you have something new, if you have something unique, it will break through. And last but not least, IPO is not the only exit. Uh, we look, look at all these big companies, they're, they're talking about their, their, you know, basically pipelines being empty. Two of them recently have said so. So, buy side realizes that as well. So hope is not lost. Uh, uh, I think it's different this time. Yago? Yeah, thanks. Yigal Nachamov, it's a city group. But just a quick comment on market cycles. Uh, from where I sit, uh, basically, the companies don't seem to really care about market cycles. The, the pipeline where I sit is very full. There are lots of companies that want to go public earlier with preclinical data, not only in oncology, but also in ophthalmology. And it really seems to be more of the, um, the capital markets and the banking side that is paying more attention to the market cycles and sort of holding the, the management teams back and saying, well, just, just let's wait until things improve a little bit. But from the, the management team perspective, it seems like there's more eagerness to go public, uh, and they don't seem to be as concerned about, about maybe a, a slightly worse valuation, but maybe just getting out there and, and getting, getting to be a public company. So I'll, I'll go on record. It's, it's never different. And when, <laughs> when the recession comes, those are the most expensive words in English. When the recession comes, biotech's going to get hit. And the median, remember, the median stock price drop in a recession is 50%. Leading industry like biotech drops 80%. It did to tech. It did to home builders and mortgages. Um, bio uh, put me on record. Biotech will okay. be Well, that's suffering. why at least five of you are called the sell side, because they're, they're the bulls on the sell side. I'm still um, on the sell side. I know, but uh, sort of half. Um, let's go on to, to this next question that Carolyn uh, started to answer for me, which is <clears throat> what are the requirements for those companies that are not yet public but are thinking about it Biotech versus medtech, what do you need to be? What's the phenotype to consider to go public today in this market that we're seeing with 
all the caveats that Joe and, and John talked about earlier. We'll start with uh, Adnan. Thanks, I'm at, Pick uh, one, medtech or biotech, and, and give biotech, us a Biotech. Uh, biotech is the space I'm, I'm uh, most comfortable with. Here, the cycle does matter. So if a space is hot, like gene therapy is hot, uh, you know, some other, other platform technology is hot, then you can probably go out even if it's an early stage company. But typically, investors like to see some proof of concept, whether that's phase two, uh, whether that's phase one. Uh, I think you don't have to wait to a phase three, but a decent sized phase two company should be able to get out. Um, track records always help, uh, so if you've had a, a history of success, you've taken th things through in the past, that will again help you. Um, a spa an indication can be hot, but then again, like I said earlier, the space, it's, the science itself is evolving, so companies are essentially creating indications that didn't exist before. That's in your hands to, to, to tell us, and we in turn get to tell the, tell the buy side and bring them to you. So if I'm to summarize phase two data for a, a, with reasonable confidence and rationale for a good therapeutic area, you can go public. I ideally phase two data. How about no two. data but in phase two? Can you go public? Having no data but in phase two? Yes. Well, show me the science first then. Okay. Yeah. Compelling science, maybe. Uh, Carolyn, how about med tech? Uh, so med tech, clearly the, the bar is... Uh, is higher. The companies have to be further along. In regards to gene therapy, we have companies going public that don't have data yet. And this morning at the gene therapy for breakfast, a bunch of us were excited about monkey data, which um, you know is was pretty compelling. But that would never happen in med tech. Um, I don't think anyone's ever got excited about a device in a monkey. Um, so with med tech, you have to have especially not I, I the monkey. That's, you can yeah. quote me on that. Yeah. Um, so I think in, in med tech, clearly you have to have data, certainly a good uh, you know, progress towards a pivotal trial and uh, good efficacy outcomes. Uh, you know, safety is usually determined fairly early on with uh, devices, but I don't think there's been much change in med tech in the 10 plus years I've been an analyst with regard to how far along you have to be. You really have to do demonstrate data in order to get do you uh, have to be revenue back. stage, profitable, certain growth um, cutoff? I think you have to have revenues on the horizon at least. Um, you know, I think there's been cases of companies going public that have been pre-revenue. And frankly, in med tech, those have been a, a mixed bag because some of them don't get to the revenue because the pivotal trials don't work out and they don't get their PMA or their PMA gets delayed. Um, so really, I think investors in med tech, the closer you can get to having that top line number, um, the better. Any uh, additional comments, agreements, disagreements with those uh, broad overviews? Phil? There's, I guess I'd, I'd add one thing on the market we're in today to differ a little bit from what Adnan said. Um, I've been doing this 15 years, and in, in those 15 years, you could always get out with proof of concept data. Um, and today, I think we are in a unique market. This is probably the top 10% of IPO markets I've been involved in where you can actually get out with good science. So we, we are doing um, a number of IPOs where there isn't proof of concept data yet. It's not clear how long that's going to last when the risk tolerance of the market uh, ebbs again these type of IPOs will probably go away. But here today in 2015, if you have good science and a management team with a track record, you can get out even without proof of concept data. So at uh, the end of the year, Thanksgiving on, is typically a bad time to go public. By show of hands, how many think there'll be a strong uh, group of offerings in the first quarter? There you have it. Get ready to go public. Okay. Advice for aspiring company CEOs and management when dealing with Wall Street and analysts as such as yourself. What, what are the mistakes you see? What are the, if you were to pick one do and one don't, we'll start with David down on the end. Um, give us, give us uh, maybe a horror story or two, anonymized of course. It's so on, on the do side, um, I, I really think it, it, management should stay positive and what, you know, this kind of, I guess, flips to the don't side, but management should focus on their own products, their own uh, strategy, and express that to analysts and investors. Uh, don't get bogged down in trying to talk about someone else's story or, you know, potential competing product. Um, I guess on the don't side, there's a little bit of do and don't there. Um, on the don't side, don't ever, 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 ever um, lie or try to obfuscate data. Um, it, it, we're all smart people. It's not going to pass. It just, you know, it, it won't. It won't. <laughs> okay, Yago. I guess I would. I guess I would say, in terms of the don'ts, um, 
you know, don't wait until until you're about to you know launch your your deal to to start to talk to us analysts. The best the best thing you can do is is try to get meetings with us as soon as possible, even when you think you might want to go public or have some thoughts about a capital raise. Uh, it's better to get in front of us early and get on our radar screens, even if you're only preclinical. Uh, that way, and that's that's also true when you meet with investors, because that way you sort of prime them, you prime their diligence efforts. They'll be more familiar with your pipeline. They'll have had a chance to do work around around your molecule and around your science, so that when you actually get to the test the waters meetings, and then when you get to the road show, uh, you know you can you can have a more valuable discussion. Okay, we'll so go I right there, we'll right down the list. So I would say uh, my advice would be do manage earnings, but don't manage to earnings. And by that, I mean certainly have a nice, clear, concise, tight earnings call where you're delivering on your metrics and relaying the well-thought-out metric that you have. Um, but certainly keep your eyes on the larger prize, your long-term one, two, three-plus-year uh, strategy uh, I think it's really important, especially if we look over developments over the last, you know, five, ten years where we're entering a period where we have more and more activist investors who are very intelligent. Uh, in 2008, there was 30 billion in activist money raised. In 2014, there was over 100 billion activist money raised. Uh, for reference, in 2014, uh, 14 billion was raised by activist funds, new money. That's 20% of hedge fund money raised in 2014. Um, that's a big number. And if you don't tell your story right, and you don't have a long-term strategy that you're delivering on consistently and being clear about, one of these activists is going to come in and tell a story better than you, and that's when you'll have a problem. Josh? In biotech, if you're IPOing and managing earnings, you waited way too long to IPO. Um, I think for, from my perspective, what's, what's by far most important is to be a master of your scientific domain. Um, I think we're, we're all, and investors are getting very sophisticated uh, uh, evaluating early science. And you know, we, we want to know that, that the science is in the hands of someone who really understands it and who's going to be able to work with it and evolve it as the field evolves over time. And, and I think that just comes from being truly, truly uh, versed, competent, and having read everything in the literature you could find, because that's what we're going to do as well. Now, Phil, I want to I modify. We were under two minutes, and I want to say, how does, the, how does management deal with the negative trial or the gray trial? It's a binary business, biotech especially. Sometimes it doesn't work out the way we hope it will. How, how, what's your advice for management when dealing with the, the missed primary endpoint, say, but some, some signals of efficacy? Yeah, I think, I think David said it well, and, and you do have to be honest, you have to be straightforward about the data. You can definitely talk about the positives you see, but you can't obfuscate any sort of uh, negative endpoint. You just have to, you have to put it out there and let the market decide what it's worth. And so, so David and Phil gave uh, succinct advice. I'll give harder advice. Build broader pipelines. Sometimes you can recover from those setbacks. You can go back to the FDA. You can change endpoints. You can make a comeback. That does happen. But broader pipelines, you can survive, you can live to fight another day. Great. Yeah, I think you're going to have the last word here. Just one quick comment on the um, negative trial. The one advice I would have to the public company CEOs is, is really try to avoid any sort of scripted responses on your call when you have a, when you have a data read that's negative. It, it just it doesn't work, and the best thing you can do is just sort of talk through it in a normal way, and that, that'll usually lead to sort of better respect uh, from us as well as the investment community. What, is the, what do you mean by scripted? What would be scripted? Well, basically where you just you kind of anticipate the, the questions and you sort of read your answers in the call. It just doesn't, doesn't tend to work out very well. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for uh, answering our candid okay. questions, and I'll invite our next panel up. Thanks.